Chapter 17. Charles Kaiser. Charles Kaiser listened to the voice on the other end of the phone explain their failure at killing David Slaughter yet again. Thanks to one of their many moles in the FBI, he now knew the man's name. As the desk squad soldier on the other end of the line talked, his grip around the phone began to tighten. When the voice on the other end delivered a personal message from Mr. Slaughter, he began to quake in anger. His highest-ranking lieutenant, Remick Sheckerly, the sharp-dressed black man with the diamond studs in his ear standing not too far away, began to slowly back away. He had witnessed too many times the explosive nature of the head of the organization, and he was about to explode right now. For just a second, Big Chuck entertained the idea of grabbing the tall, dark-skinned Caribbean man by his goatee and snapping his neck, but Remy, as he was known, had been loyal and committed to him for years. It was easy to bend people to his will through fear and intimidation, but true loyalty in his profession was scarce. He would have to settle in some other direction for his rage. Although the Mafia boss was 55, his physical appearance betrayed someone much younger. He had smooth, clean-shaven, chiseled features. Pierced blue eyes looked out from beneath a rich head of coal-colored hair, styled by a $600 haircut. And he was Olympian in both size and stature. To put it simply, Charles Kaiser was a giant of a man. He stood at six feet eight inches and was covered in boulders of muscles from his ears to his toes. Extremely health conscious, he followed a rigid exercise routine, focusing mainly on anything to do with extremely heavy weights. Running was looked on with disdain, and he had little to do with things that focused on getting toned. He instead concentrated on anything involving brute strength and power. He was as large and hard-surfaced as the heavy weights he worked out with. When he walked into a room, he wanted to be the biggest thing in it, in every sense of the phrase. He was standing in a sort of conference room on the fourth floor of an aging building, his back to an enormous oak table nearly 20 feet long. He used it to conduct business meetings with various leaders, both within and without his organization. The room was really nothing more than a brick-lined, partitioned-off section of a gigantic warehouse. It was part of a large multi-warehouse complex in North Denver. His men liked to call it the Keep. It was a vast maze of interconnected buildings, both old and new, that sprawled their way along the South Platte River. It was nearly impervious to electronic snooping by the feds because of all the steel and contained a number of hidden pathways into and out of the place. It was the hulking nerve center to his entire empire. He hung up the phone and tucked it away inside the breast pocket of his hand-tailored three-piece silk suit. He turned around, raised his arms above his head, balled his fists together, and brought them down like twin sledgehammers into the middle of the massive table. He felt the wood give slightly and heard it pop as the support splintered under the blow. Somehow, it managed to stay together. The darker side of him wanted to continue destroying the table and the rest of the room. Only destruction could make him feel better. He closed his eyes and made himself pause. With effort, he shoved that part of himself into the background. He needed a focused mind to see his way through the current situation. Standing, he turned around and straightened his clothes. He bent his head over towards his shoulder, first left, then right, and cracked his neck. Remy backed off even further. After adjusting his tie, he spoke in measured tones. Bring me... Mr. Franceschi. Remy quietly obeyed and moved at once to open one side of the double doors located against the far wall. Saying nothing, he motioned to someone outside the door and Pete Franceschi entered. There was fear in the young man's steps as he timidly drew closer to stand before him. Charles could tell it was everything the young man could do just to look him in the eye. Sir, you, you have every right to want to kill me, Pete began. But I know the only thing that will bring you any comfort over the loss of your son is the death of the man that took your son's life. Charles displayed no emotion as he answered. If you could have killed him, he would be dead. Instead, you have failed me. You failed my son that you were sworn to protect with your life. Y yes, sir, I did. Pete took a step closer as he continued. But I can still do the next best thing. I can make him come here to you. Without any more loss of valuable men, I promise I could get him to walk in here and kneel at your feet like a lamb for slaughter. Charles paused before speaking. And please tell me, just how could you perform this magic trick, Mr. Franceschi? 
Pete quickly reached into his jacket pocket, and Remy took a step forward, placing his hand on the silver beretta at his side, and Pete froze. Big Chuck held up a hand to call off his lieutenant. Remy dutifully paused and silently retreated. Slowly this time, Pete removed a crumpled white envelope and held it up. This, he said, this is a letter from his in-laws. Based on the contents that you could read for yourself, they are the last remaining family he has. I would bet he would do anything to keep them safe. Take them hostage, and he'll walk in here and present himself to you. Their address is right on the outside. Pete's posture had straightened as he talked, convinced that this revelation would save his life. Charles could see it in his eyes. He reached up and took the envelope and inspected the outside. He could read the handwritten return address on the front. Opening it, he unfolded the letter to scan through the contents. It appeared the young man was correct. His assumption that Mr. Slaughter would give up his life as forfeit to keep them safe was likely true as well. Charles nodded in agreement as he returned the letter to the envelope and then tucked it into his inside coat pocket. He smiled. Well done, Mr. Franceschi. You have saved yourself from hours of unbearable torture. He laughed aloud at his own joke. Pete gave a nervous half-grin and seemed unsure of how to respond. Charles let him sit there in his uncertainty for a moment then reached out and grabbed him by the neck. He hauled Pete off the ground with one mighty arm. The young man's feet began to kick, and Pete desperately clawed at Big Chuck's fingers to try and free himself. His face quickly began to turn purple, and his eyes bulged a bit from the pressure. With his free hand, Big Chuck reached into the folds of his suit and produced an enormous black 50 AE caliber Desert Eagle pistol. He placed it against the forehead of Pete and pulled the trigger. The entire top of his head was obliterated and turned into flying bloody bits. Remy, standing to one side and seeing what was coming, barely got his hands over his ears before the big cannon went off. The concussion of the gigantic weapon rattled the large wall of windows that made up one side of the room with such force that Big Chuck thought some of the panes might break. Behind him came a loud snapping noise, though not nearly at the volume of the huge pistol. The gigantic oak table finally gave way, cracking cleanly through the middle and collapsing with a reverberating crash into the aging floor. He relaxed his fingers and watched the lifeless form of Pete Franceschi fall to the worn concrete. Then, he held out his hand towards Remy, waiting for the man to respond with his silent request. The man reached into his coat and pulled forth a silk handkerchief, handing it over for the big man to wipe his hands free of the blood from Pete. Clean this mess up, he ordered calmly, and get me a new table. The Caribbean man set about doing just that, walking to the door and issuing orders to invisible forms on the other side. Charles walked to the opposite end of the room, opened an identical set of ancient-looking double doors, and stepped into the expansive office. On the same outside wall that mirrored the conference room was floor-to-floor -floor ceiling warehouse-styled windows with perfect square panes. On the far end sat a regal desk that was as impressive in its carved detail as it was in its size. Of course, anything designed and meant for Charles Kaiser had to be large and impressive. Not too far away from the desk stood a giant fireplace. It was a late addition to the room in order to make the fourth floor of the warehouse seem warmer and more inviting. In front of it were arranged a matching overstuffed leather couch and four huge chairs. Next to the fireplace was a large wooden bar with an impressive collection of whiskeys, scotches, and other liquors stored in crystal decanters. Charles did not drink, however. He believed it impaired judgment and left one vulnerable to mistakes and weak before one's enemies. The purpose of the bar was to make guests feel at ease and comfortable, so as to make them more pliable to coercion. Some people perform better through the use of a carrot rather than the stick. The ornately carved bar was nothing more than a means to that end, just another tool for Charles to get people to do what he wanted. He took only a few steps into the room and onto a waiting sheet of plastic, and stopped in front of a sizable Persian rug covering most of the floor. There, he stripped off his now bloodied suit until he was wearing nothing at all. Stepping onto the rug, he crossed over near his desk. To one side was a gigantic wardrobe. In it were stored more suits, undergarments, and handmade shoes from Italy. As he stood in front of the wardrobe, unabashed in his nakedness, he called over his shoulder to Remy. See, those are burned. Right on the concrete outside the windows. Have them laid out so I can see them from up here. On the other side of the glass, four stories below, was a large space surrounded by more warehouses. 
He wanted to make sure that all of his clothes were destroyed so that no evidence of his murderous act were left to point to him. Some things he could trust to his surrogates. Other things needed to be overseen personally. A good CEO of any successful organization knew when to become personally involved in management and when to delegate responsibility. As he dressed, he considered what he must do now. He could not give up his quest to make Mr. Slaughter pay for killing his son, of course. To not follow through on that would be to demonstrate impotence to those that must be made to both respect and fear him. The DS soldier he had just conferred with on the phone made sure to inform him they had killed the FBI informant Brian Ainsley as planned. He could not afford to have that loose end out there providing evidence against him. He hated to lose any asset, but Mr. Ainsley had outlived his usefulness. At least that had been accomplished, he thought. Besides, he still had plenty of other agents working for him. He thought about the leverage that the late Pete had provided him. It would indeed provide perfect influence over Mr. Slaughter. But the man was now in the protection of another FBI agent, an outsider whom he did not know. This newcomer to his territory presented a problem. Ainsley had said the man's name was Brett Foster, an agent out of Dallas. Agent Foster would never allow Mr. Slaughter to just hand himself over, and Charles would have difficulty in even reaching Mr. Slaughter to give him his terms. Plus, he needed to be sure that any plan he put into motion was not going to point back to him. Mr. Foster was supposed to have died right along with everyone else, but now any plan of attack Charles followed would have to include this other agent as well. In addition to that, there was a girl now added into the equation. Who was she? Where did she come from? Was she just a passerby? It was unknown at this time. Chances are she was someone working at the clinic that the other two were able to rescue. His DS operative had stated that it appeared the escaped Agent Foster was injured. How extensive were his injuries? Would he seek medical attention? Would he reach out to other agents back in Dallas? Or would he make the mistake of reaching out to the corrupted Denver office? And then there was the threat that Mr. Slaughter had made, saying he was coming for him. Was it just an anger-filled threat with no possible way to back up? That was probable, as he would have to get away from his FBI protector in order to follow through on that threat. It was also unlikely that he knew very much about Charles Kaiser's organization or how to find him. There was simply no path forward without additional information. He strolled over to the window and looked down into the courtyard below. There, two men had placed his bloody clothing into small piles and were pouring gasoline over them. When they had completed their task, they turned their heads upwards towards the windows, seeking approval. They spotted him standing in the wall of windows above them. He gave them a thumbs up. One of them tossed a lit cigarette into the pile, and it went up with an audible whoosh that could be heard all the way to where Charles now stood. He watched as the flames burned up any evidence of his crime while he finished dressing by tying his knot. Remy, he said to the figure he knew was standing dutifully behind him, get me everything you can on this Agent Foster.'